And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call as tonight the Indiana Hoosiers defeat the Kennesaw State Owls 99-72 to in a game that was uncomfortably close in the second half as Kennesaw State actually made it a six-point game with about, I don't know, maybe 15, 16 minutes left there in the second half before Indiana turned up the heat a little bit on defense, got it going with a, with a big run, and then cruised to the victory. Uh, but not the complete 40-minute performance I think that a lot of us had hoped. And in fact, eerily, a little bit too much like the Notre Dame game, uh, you know, where you felt like it maybe could have been a little bit worse in the first half. The Hoosiers don't play great at the start of the second half, but then need a big run late to get going. Fortunately for Indiana, Kennesaw State not nearly as good as Notre Dame, so they weren't able to take advantage of Indiana's lackluster play. But we will break it all down for you tonight. On this episode of the Assembly Call, we'll break down this game, as well as spend some time looking ahead to Big Ten season. I am your host, Jared Morris. I am here tonight with Andy Bottoms and Will DeWitt. Uh, and let's get going uh, with how we always start the show, with the banner moment. And tonight's banner moment, uh, quite clearly for me, was the play of the freshmen. I thought all three freshmen were outstanding tonight. You know, Thomas Bryant, you can look at the box score and you can see his contributions. 20 points, 8 of 9 from the field. He had 5 rebounds, a couple of blocks. I thought he played with good energy and emotion for most of the game. Uh, and then the other two guys who came in off the bench, and the numbers don't jump off of the box score, but if you watch this game, you know the impact that they made, and that's Juwan Morgan and OG and Anobi, uh, who, good for them, had some nice signature plays there at the end. Juwan with a nice dunk, OG uh, with his first collegiate three-pointer. But specifically, Juwan Morgan was a key part of Indiana's run in the second half because the Hoosiers came out, played very lackluster defense to start the second half, and it was the normal starters minus Colin Hartman in for Robert Johnson. But when Tom Crean went to the bench and he went with a lineup of Yogi, uh, Thomas Bryant, Juwan Morgan, Robert Johnson, and Colin Hartman, and they really had about a 5-6 possession sequence on defense that was outstanding. And I thought in a lot of ways, Juwan Morgan keyed it by just playing hard, harassing dribblers, getting rebounds, or at least being in position. And he really, really played well. And the reason why I'm so encouraged by this is, you know, it's nice to see freshmen play with that kind of intensity, really try to do things the right way. And that's what's impressed me the most about Thomas Bryant, Juwan Morgan, and OG Ananobi. You know, we can criticize some mistakes they make, you know, some overzealousness on offense, some turnovers, you know, every now and then on defense not being in the right position simply because they don't have the experience. But you never question their effort. You never question their hustle. And they play low. They play with good fundamentals. And it gives me hope for the future of this program, especially on the defensive end, when you see guys out there like Juwan who care so much. And so a big tip of the cap tonight to the freshmen. You know, I'm not sure you learn a lot about the upperclassmen in these guarantee games against the sub-300 opponents, but I think they're big games for the freshmen to come in, get comfortable, gain some confidence. And I thought all three of those guys did an excellent job today, and that is the banner moment. All right, let's go around the horn, get some opening thoughts from Andy and Will before we dive into breaking down this game even more. Andy, over to you first. Your bottom's line on tonight's IU victory. Well, I mean, it feels a little bit like a broken record where we, we try to pick moments out of some of these games when we wonder if it'll be the turning point and guys will start to realize, you know, the level of effort that needs to be played with, particularly on defensive end. And it was apparent pretty early on tonight that that, uh, that kind of lesson learned from the Notre Dame game hadn't hadn't sunk in yet. I, you know, Kennesaw State really got in the lane at will in the first half. They had 10 offensive rebounds, so they only ended up having one, I think, in the second half. So that was a, you know, a good job by IU to, you know, to, to ch turn that around. But, man, it was just a really ugly uh, run of play through pretty much the first half and into the beginning of the second, as you mentioned, when it got to a six-point game. And while you never really felt like the game was in doubt, you knew that IU was going to turn it on. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily um, what you'd want to see heading into Big Ten play, and off coming off of a big win where it felt like some of the lessons that you hope were learned toward the end of that game just uh, you know weren't quite there. So I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it, I think it's something that comes up a lot in these games against these sub 300 teams where you know going in you're not really going to learn a lot. You you feel like you're going to win, and and I don't know how much of that sinks into the players. It's a tough time to play. It's right before the holiday. Uh, I, you know, I do understand all that, but the, the kind of attentiveness and, 
and focus just really wasn't there for long stretches of the game tonight. And I think that's, you know, continues to be a concern, particularly on the defensive end when, um, you know, on the possessions where they did really well, you know, some of those poor possessions right after Juwan Morgan came in, um, you know, these guys are capable of playing good defense. Kennesaw State is not a good offensive team. They're like 325th, 335th in efficiency coming in uh, on Pomeroy, and they were on pace for 80 points at some point in the game tonight. I mean, there's uh, really no excuse for some of the defensive breakdowns that were continuously seen in the first half and early in the second. I think, unfortunately, the scoreboard won't tell that story, but anybody who uh, had the at what it sometimes was misfortune of watching this game probably doesn't come away feeling very rosy. No, not at all. Will, your stat of the night. Stat of the night, guys. I'm looking at the free throw rate tonight. IU had a 60.8% free throw rate, while Kennesaw State only had a 14.8. Uh, that led to a difference of field free throw attempts. IU with 31. Kennesaw only had 9. And IU was actually in the bonus with around 17 minutes remaining in this game, which... I think they played aggressive and they took advantage of that, which obviously is indicative by the 31 free throw attempts. But I thought that was probably the biggest differential in stats I saw tonight, which is the reason why it's going to be my stat of the night. Good stat and just and quick explanation we should give on that because free throw rate can be one that's a little bit uh, can be a little bit confusing. There's free throw rate and free throw percentage. Free throw rate is the number of free throw attempts divided by field goal attempts, and, and so that's obviously different than your percentage. The Hoosier shot 71 percent. Kennesaw State shot 66 percent from the line, but the Hoosiers you know went to the line a lot more. To your point, Will, and so I think that was obviously important. And you know you'll see that a lot in games like this where Indiana has a height advantage, you know a size advantage advantage and aggressiveness advantage and at home as well and that's what Indiana needs to do in a game like this and hopefully that's something they can carry in uh, to games against other competition as well. Well a quick reminder real quick to everybody make sure that you get on our email list get the IU Hoops newsletter uh, we've been saying join the 1300 plus IU fans who are on the newsletter we can now triumphantly say the 1400 plus IU fans on the newsletter because we had a lot of signups after that Notre Dame game and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, there are two ways to get on that list you can go to a assemblycall.com slash subscribe and enter your email address or you can text Indiana to 44144 and then enter your email address there and you will be automatically registered and you will get our post-game email analysis which includes my analysis, Andy's analysis, Will's stat of the night uh, and we don't put that up publicly. It is only for our email subscribers and so join the list. Make sure you get on there because it's a great way to connect with the show and stay up to date on your Hoosiers. All right, well, you are listening to the Assembly Call. We are recapping Indiana's 99-72 victory over Kennesaw State. And, Andy, you know, I, I want to talk about a storyline that I thought reared its head tonight. You and I had an email exchange about it this week. Uh, I'm hoping we can get some content up on the site about it. And it is the difference in Indiana's defense when Troy Williams and James Blackman Jr. are on the floor. And I thought tonight you could really see it. You know, I thought, you know, both of those guys started in the second half. And we talked about the big run that Indiana went on in the second half, which was keyed by defense. Well, that was when Troy and James Blackman Jr. sat the bench. And it's something that we've noticed. It's something that we've seen that, you know, when those two guys are on the floor together, the defensive issues seem to be exacerbated. Is that is that something that you've seen as well? Uh, and is it something that moving forward... You know, obviously we know that those two guys are very good offensively and it increases Indiana's offensive ceiling. But is that the kind of adjustment that you think moving forward could be something if Indiana is really committed to playing better defense, it may not be able to play those two guys at the same time unless both are willing to buy in a little bit more to the team concept on defense. Yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see uh, once I, like I, I told you this week, I think once I get the uh, lineups done for this, um, for this Kennesaw State game, I'll kind of look back and try to do some kind of summary of, uh, of what we've seen over the non-conference schedule. So, you know, you got 13 games under our belt at this stage, and so um, can ideally start to be able to see some trends there. I think what we may see is it, it might not be as bad as we think because of some of the offensive things that you bring up, that, um, you know, with those two guys on the floor, the offense is going to be that much better. So does it end up that, that numbers where they're both on the floor end up uh, not, as, not as bad as we might think? But it is... It is interesting, and I know that we both mentioned this on Twitter, that we started to pay really close attention to what Blackman was doing in particular when he came back on the floor. I think um, we've, we've started to see some signs from Troy, albeit inconsistent, that um, you know he'll get in a stance, make some defensive plays. And I thought when he came back in the game, you could tell there was 
uh, more of an aggression from him defensively, going after defensive rebounds and, and things like that. I think blocking out is still uh, an area where he gets beat a lot on defense, where he's just you know, either trying to, you know, leak out to get on the floor or just relying on his athletic ability to go and get the ball, which um, is not necessarily a terrible thing from a uh, the standpoint of his athleticism. But I think that's one issue that he has. But I, I was, uh, I didn't really see much of any change in, in Blackman once he came back in the game. And I know you uh, mentioned before that you, you charted something, so we can talk through that separately. But I, I you know, I don't feel like uh, the message of the, the bench being a motivator really got through to Blackman, maybe in the same way as it did to Troy. And I thought, you know, Troy in particular played a little point guard after um, he came back in as well and did a fairly good job. I think he ended up with three or four turnovers. Um, but I thought he made some good decisions, and there were times when he slowed things down on the offensive end as well. So um, whether you can attribute that to the bench and the perspective that he gained from being over there or not, I don't really know. But I definitely, when I watched James Blackman Jr. play defense after he was on the bench, it didn't look like it was having much of an impact. No, it didn't at all. And I, I was really interested to see what would happen because, you know, we talked about the impact the defense made. In Kennesaw State, there was a 12-minute period, the final eight minutes of the first half and the first four minutes of the second half. Kennesaw State won 23-16. to So over a 12-minute period of basketball, Indiana was defeated by a sub-300 team, 23-16. to I know you're going to have little lulls in games, but for that extended of a run, you really shouldn't see that. And... You know, so I was really interested to see the Hoosiers then, you know, once that lineup came in that I talked about, you know, Yogi, Bryant, Juwan Morgan, Robert Johnson, and Colin Hartman, those guys played really well defensively. And in fact, Kennesaw State scored a couple buckets against that group, making wild shots, tough shots, but the defense was better. So it was 62-51 when Troy and Blackman came back in together. And I made a note, okay, how is the defense? And... Over about the next three or four possessions, Troy was outstanding on offense. He had that big dunk. He made a three. He was terrific. And I didn't notice anything glaring about him defensively. But I paid special attention to James because I really wanted to see if him sitting the bench, because he sat the bench for a long time, if that would change his mentality. And I'll just read you my notes here, okay, because I went possession by possession. First possession, Blackman bailed out by a bad pass, should have been a layup. The guy cut right by him. Second possession, Blackman gets beat by a cutter, commits foul, holding the man to keep him from having free entry into the lane. Third possession, weak defense on a screen, his man got the ball, he's out of position, his man drives all the way in and scores as the rest of the team scrambled to try and recover. The fourth possession, he wasn't involved. Fifth possession, his man drove right by him but missed a pretty wide open layup. Sixth possession, Blackman's man drove right by him for an easy bucket in the lane. Seventh possession, man cut right in front of his face but no one saw him, so no one could get him a pass. Eighth possession, man uh, took him one-on-one, -on -one, scored. I think that was where Blackman got the block, but wasn't able to get the ball. His man still ended up scoring. And then on the ninth possession, his man got an easy look from three, didn't make it. On the tenth possession, he wasn't involved. And so, you know, it, it looked bad on my notes. It looked bad watching it. I hope it sounded bad. And, you know, I don't want to criticize James. You know, we, we, we don't like criticizing the players, but... You know, I, I, I just think that the frustration that Indiana fans have is you see what a player can be, what a team can be, and where they are right now. And you see what James does on offense. And it's so fantastic sometimes. And again, tonight, he was very efficient offensively, 19 points, you know, 6 of 12 shooting. He's 4 of 7 from downtown. You know, and he hunted shots a little bit, and I'd like to see him in games like this distribute a little bit more. And it's not to say that you know you can't play him, but I just think at the ends of games, those are the kind of mistakes defensively that get you beat. Those are the kind of mistakes defensively that that your offense cannot compensate for. And I just, you know, we, we've seen that. We saw it from him last year. We've seen it a lot this year, and it just doesn't seem to be improving. And it just leaves you wondering what exactly Tom Crean can do to get through to him. And, you know, we saw he and he and James talking at the end of the game. We don't know what they were talking about. But I just think, you know, for, for Indiana to get to the next level, to reach its potential come Big Ten play, James has to become a better defender. And, and, and Andy, I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what you think he can do to do that. I mean, we saw it, you know, think about the Northwestern game in the Big Ten tournament last year. You know, he played like his hair was on fire, was terrific. and But we just don't see that from him consistently enough. Yeah, I, I know exactly the stretch of possessions. I found myself nodding along because I, I didn't write it down, but I did the same thing. At, at that point, the game had pretty much been put out of reach, and, and you just wanted to see you know, how he would respond to that. And I don't really know what it is. I mean, some of it is just basic fundamentals. I, I not really jokingly tweeted out that you know he, there was a ball screen 35 feet from the basket. He chases the guy around it instead of going under the screen. 
um, and lets him get to the rim. I think that was maybe the third or fourth possession that you had talked about. And, I mean, I've got an eight-year-old daughter that I coach, and we talked a lot about this against what's the, one of the teams we played, and I said, there, nobody's going to beat you from out there. If they make shots from out there, then so be it. But you cannot chase them and let them get straight to the basket. And, I mean, just basic third-grade basketball stuff, he's just not doing. And... Uh, there was a possession in the first half where, you know, guy gets a, a rebound inside of him, didn't really try at all to get around him to do anything else, and misses another shot, and the guy gets a rebound right back and puts it back in. I mean, I, it, it just is incomprehensible to me how how he can be beat when he can show great athleticism on the offensive end of the floor. And um, whether it's he just doesn't know what they're trying to do, the play where he got beat baseline, it was as if he thought there was help there, but there wasn't at all because of the way the defense was positioned. So um, I, I honestly don't know. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And I think you know, maybe Tom Crean is out of answers in the same way that we are, but he, he is rarely kind of in a good stance and able to change direction very quickly. And maybe that doesn't present itself as well on offense because he knows where he's going. Um, but just some of those kind of just general change of direction and first step seems to be a big issue that he just, you know, I don't know if he just relaxes a minute and, the, and by then the guy's already by him and it's just too late. I think that was, that felt like the case when uh, the, he committed the foul on the on the cutter that time that you talked about. It's like he just kind of got lulled to sleep for a minute even though the guy wasn't standing there that long. He just reached out and grabbed him. Um, and, and just seems like a second slow. The, the three-pointer you mentioned at the end of that sequence is just, he's just slow to get a hand up. I mean, the guy's right in front of him just slow to do that, and I, and I don't know what that is because, again, we've talked about this with him and Troy, it feels like incessantly as the season's gone on, is, you know, they're tremendous athletes. It, it isn't a question of athleticism or, or any of those things. It just just doesn't seem to be there, and I, I don't know what's going to get it there because, to me, sitting on the bench for, you know, a good, I don't know, six, eight minutes of the game, it felt like, you know, of game time, um, would do it, but to your point, you really didn't see anything else, and um, I, I'm just not sure. And it, I found it interesting. We can talk more about Robert Johnson and some of the you know other playing time kind of things. I found it interesting that Johnson didn't start the beginning of the second half, um, which I assume to be um, because of you know you're trying to get better defense in there. I just don't know how you leave Blackman in there. It, Johnson's proven to be one of the better defenders. I don't know why he would start it out on the bench, and there was speculation that it was injury related but he was one of the first people to come in afterward and was part of that run so I don't really and maybe that's where the the bench as motivator message doesn't quite get through because it's unclear when it is and isn't being used for that but um, I, I definitely like you watch those possessions and was just as disappointed in the way that that James seemed to respond to that uh, what had to be a challenge I would think from the coaching staff to really come out and buckle down yeah, and a good comment from Gerb in our chat, you know, who says that, you know, James has been the dominant player at every level, can score 30 on anyone, and the defense hasn't really been required. And that is true. And you see a lot of times with freshmen, especially, you know, freshmen who scored a lot of points in high school that were known for their offense, they struggle to adjust defensively. And I think that's, you know, and, and we, I thought, you know, we're, we're very fair with James last year, and, and we've been fair with him this year, and I think we're being fair with him tonight. But, you know, it's time for him to take that next step up. And, and I certainly think that, you know, with defense, you can lay blame at the at the feet of the player for not stepping up and taking more personal responsibility. But it also goes to the program culture and to the coach and to demanding it and, and not accepting less. And, and I think there has there seemed to be a trade off where James provides so much on offense that we allow the defense. But just imagine if for a moment, if we weren't so myopic and if we sacrificed a little bit of his offense for a little while to 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 prove a point and to show him you're not going to be able to get out there and do the things you do on offense if you don't defend. It will make you a better player. And we're not in practice. You know, we don't, as Ryan would say, we don't know all the context. We don't know what is said. All we know is that the results aren't quite there. And we all want it to be there so much because we know how important, how big of a lift it could make for this team if a guy like James starts playing better defense. So, you know, again, we don't want to beat this, you know, beat a dead horse, but I think there's so much potential there and, and it's just, it's time to start seeing more of it. So, by the way, Indiana did win 99-72 <laughs> tonight. I know if you watched that last five or ten minutes, it wasn't the most positive, but you know, you'll forgive us if we don't want to get too excited about a 27-point win against a sub-300 team. Uh, you know, This is the kind of game where you're looking for habits. You're looking for those little signs of what can carry forward. And while a lot of plaudits for the freshmen, you know, I think play from some of the upperclassmen 
or, or you know, non-freshman guys like James left a little bit to be desired. But, Will, let's go for some positives here because uh, certainly offensively for the Hoosiers, you know, any night that you go out and you score 1.56 points per possession uh, against any team, there's some positives on offense, uh, and you have a, a good stat that alludes to that. Yeah, I'll get to the stat here in a second, but uh, really, to me, the biggest takeaway of the game was the ball movement. It started on the very first possession of the game. I really liked how uh, James Blackman, he kind of drove in, but then he pulled back, and then he found that open shooter. I thought that was uh, a good sign for the rest of the game, and it really kind of uh, led to it. Uh, for me, really, the best uh, passing of the game came between Bryant and Tro uh, Troy Williams. I thought together they were doing a lot of nifty passing, you know, especially down low. Either it was Troy finding you know, Bryant for an easy layup or the other way around or some back-and-forth passing. To me, it was nice, and it was fun basketball to watch. Um, one of my favorites was... Uh, you know, for Troy in the first half, he was uh, driving in, you know, to the lane, and then he would kind of go away from the basket, take the defenders away, and then Bryant would just kind of swoop in under the basket and be wide open for an easy layup or a dunk, which, again, really good ball movement today. Um, today we had assists on 62.5% of the first half shots, but then obviously we kind of hit that lull there, so we finished with 54.8%, still not bad. We had 18 assists today, only 13 throughout the whole game against Notre Dame, so that's definite improvement. And then, yeah, it just goes back to the ball movement, guys. To me, it was definitely an improvement compared to the last few games. Yeah, and it's always a good sign for Indiana when they're, you know, it's a good sign for any team when you're assisting on 50-plus percent of your buckets, and the Hoosiers did that. And I'll echo your point about some of the interior passing between Troy and Thomas was terrific. And it's nice to see Troy looking for Thomas. And I think that's another big positive that comes out of this game for me is how focused Indiana seemed to be on getting it down to Thomas Bryant. And, and sometimes we've seen that early on, and then it's faded. But I thought tonight when Thomas was on the floor, his teammates really seemed interested in getting him the ball, which we haven't always seen and he was demanding it now you know they don't have a, a player over six foot seven who plays more than 50 percent of their minutes and so this isn't exactly a representative uh you know game for what we're going to see in big 10 play but it was still nice to see you know and anytime troy has six assists you know that's good obviously the four turnovers aren't good but the six assists are uh andy uh let's talk about Rob, robert johnson real quick because and I think a lot of people are wondering why he sat at the start of the second half. I thought that it might have been, you know, kind of the ankle issue, but it clearly wasn't. He came back in, and just from some anecdotal evidence that we've received from folks who were at the game, you know, it seemed like, you know, he was having some pretty in-depth conversations with Coach Crean, you know, maybe didn't have the body language that seemed too happy to have been sitting on the bench, uh, as any good competitive player would. You know, I wonder for him if it wasn't so much the defense, and I actually, I, I can't, think back to times in the first half where I thought he was playing poor defensively, although the whole team looked pretty listless there for a while. But I wonder if it was offensive because, you know, Robert has been such an efficient offensive player, but tonight, you know, only took three shots. Uh, and, you know, I think one or two of those came right after he came back in the game in the second half. I even tweeted, you know, I want to see Robert be more assertive and he came right in and did it. I wonder if that was it, you know, because, you know, Crean, we know he, he focuses a lot on offense and playing fast and being aggressive, and, and Robert didn't really seem to have that on the offensive end, and we're speculating a little bit, but, you know, I think you look at, at a game from Robert where he has five points, only one assist, only one rebound, you know, I think you expect a little more from him than that, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, it's interesting. That you, I hadn't really even thought of it that way uh, until we talked for a couple minutes before we came on, and I think when you... You know, you kind of lay it out. I think that could could definitely be it. He was he seemed far less aggressive than he was against Notre Dame. I know a lot of his points on Notre Dame came against um, came on three pointers, but uh, I, I thought he was still really aggressive going to the basket. And you only get three shots for him tonight. I'm sure that's a season low uh, without even looking and and you know made two of them. But even the other things that he's typically a little more involved in uh, from a rebounding and an assist standpoint. I, you know, I think that could be it. Um, I don't recall, much like you, any specific possessions where he really struggled defensively, but I also think uh, we're probably pretty quick to give him the benefit of the doubt as one of the typically better defenders on the team. Uh, so, you know, maybe there was more there than I thought. Uh, I would agree with the, you know, the injury thing that it seems like he's pretty banged up and it felt like a game potentially where um, you could get him a little bit of extra rest. But I also think it's, it's probably tough for a guy like him to really be that aggressive offensively. I mean, in any given... Moment. I mean, if you figure starting lineup wise, he's probably the fourth option. I would guess, if not, if not lower, if not the fifth, um, with the starters. So I thought that was, you know, I think that's a little bit difficult. Where you know, in most scenarios, you don't necessarily want the guy who's that you know fourth, fifth option being 
uh, overly aggressive, even though he's played extremely well on the offensive end this year. So uh, I'd be interested to see, and I don't know what, if anything, will be said about that after the game, but I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, what that was really all about or if we get any insight into what that was. Yeah. Hey, are you concerned at all about this trend Indiana seems to be falling into where, you know, they kind of, they start out the game okay the first five, six minutes, and then really, the, the, you know, it seems like the first halves get progressively worse. At least these last two games come out kind of lackluster in the second half and then explode, you know, there at about the, you know, maybe the last 10 minutes of the second half. And again, we talk about habits, and I'm just, I'm a little worried that Indiana's getting into a habit where they think they can just erase some poor play early with a nice 10-12 spurt at the end of the game, you know, which, hey, we were able to do it against Notre Dame, and that's great, and you're able to do it tonight against Kennesaw State, but you're playing with fire. You know, a game like tonight, you let a team, you know, hang around who maybe shouldn't hang around. Like, let's say, you know, a Minnesota or a Nebraska comes into Assembly Hall. You let them hang around. They don't go away as easily as Kennesaw State, and I don't know that there's much, you know, to do about this, but do, do you at all – look for that kind of thing in a game like this, and does it at all concern you, just maybe the pattern this team's starting to fall into? Well, it's interesting. I, I think that's one of the things that makes games like this against this level of competition so difficult, is that it is... To some, you're, you're trying to fight against human nature, uh, particularly human nature of college kids, to, you know, to, to get up for these games, and there have been so many of them... Uh, really, since coming back from Maui, I mean, other than you know Duke and Notre Dame, every game has kind of been in this category, and so um, I do think there's some challenges in in trying to get these guys up for uh, some of these games and to be able to sustain that effort. At the same time, um, you know, like we talked about at the beginning, you want to see that carryover effect from the end of that Notre Dame game and really build upon that, as opposed to regress a little bit and then you know kind of come back in a game that you, you again you never really felt like was going to be lost, but um, just just wasn't very impressive, and it's in some ways it's interesting because I think we've we've cited a number of times over the course of the season where the bench has really come in and given a good lift, um, but for whatever reason that doesn't seem to happen as much in the first half. Uh, I thought early tonight they had probably one of the longer runs of play for the starters to start the game uh, as any that I can recall this season. I'm not sure the first subs came in until around the under 12 timeout. So, um, you know those guys had played quite a bit, and then you know, trying to figure out the right combinations of guys to put in after that, I don't know. But it was definitely a troubling pattern and, and one that you can very easily get in the habit of against teams like this because you know you're going to be able to come back. You know, Notre Dame doesn't necessarily fall in that category. But um, I, I do think uh, it, it's it's somewhat of a concern, especially when you start to think about these first couple of Big Ten games that are coming up when you know we've all talked about uh, how things set up pretty well. But again, you allow teams with, you know, playing in the Big Ten to get a little confidence and hang around, uh, there's definitely a lot more potential for disaster against those teams, particularly like in Nebraska, as an example, uh, as opposed to what you'd see tonight against Kennesaw State. All right, well, Will, you're over there crunching some numbers, and you gave us some good news last time, but now you have some not-so-good news. Yeah, uh, two concerns here on defense. I mean, obviously, we have few here, guys, but uh, just looking here at offense rebounds, you know, we're still giving up 33%. We gave up 33% tonight. That seems to be our average looking here at the Ken Palm ratings, which still is not good. Um, at the half, we gave up 10. Second half, we gave up 1. But still, guys, concerning to give up all those offensive boards, especially because Jared, you brought up, too, that, you know, Kennesaw State, they're a small team, I and mean, we have all these, you know, bigger guys, especially like Bryant and everything. You expect them to get some more rebounds than they did tonight. Um, if you take a look at the numbers real quick for, you know, just at the rebounds with the guys, it's, I mean, just looking, you know, Bryant only had the five and then Williams had four. So, I mean, you expect them to, to get some more boards than they did tonight. And then another stat that's kind of a little bit disheartening here is points in the paint. We allowed 46 against Notre Dame. All right, guys, that's Notre Dame. I can kind of understand that. But then tonight we gave up 40. So now I'm starting to think it's a trend that we should keep an eye on because, Obviously, we're allowing, we're allowing these teams to get some nice, easy, you know, buckets underneath the basket. Really not contesting the shots, and uh, definitely a concern for me. Well, that's a concern. And Andy, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that points in the paint because when you look at who did the damage for Kennesaw State, you know, we always wonder who's going to have their career game against Indiana. Well, Yanel Brown scores 26 points. Kendrick Ray scores 22 points. They score 72 as a team. And Will, you just mentioned. Uh, 40 of those points were in the paint. So you might think that Yanel Brown and Kendrick Ray are, you know, big men playing with their back to the basket. Yanel Brown is 5'9", Kendrick Ray is 6'1". 
unfortunately, Indiana gives up a lot of points in the paint to guards <laughs> just off of penetration and guys getting in there when they shouldn't and, you know, the you know big men sometimes being out of position. You know, and Thomas Bryant, as much as he tries, you know, there was a possession where, you know, a, a, it was either Brown or Ray drove right by their man from the top of the key and, and Thomas just, he wasn't in the right position and also not quick enough laterally to get over there and stop the dribbler, which is one of his limitations as a rim protector. But, you know, Andy, I know, what can Indiana, I don't know, this is like a question that we keep asking every game, but what can Indiana do to stop these guards from getting in the paint and just penetrating anywhere they want to go? It seems like, you know, at times, you know, the zones seem to work some against Notre Dame, you know, and we saw it a little bit in the first half tonight. Uh, but ultimately, you know, when you let two guards from Kennesaw State who entered the game uh, with uh, offensive ratings of less than 100, and just by way of comparison, you know, Yogi's offensive rating is like 125, 130. You know, and these guys are down under 100, and yet they're scoring like this. I mean, what is that? Is it just guys taking more personal responsibility to keep their guys out of the lane, communication, lack of cohesion, or the probable answer, D, all of the above? It's definitely, definitely all of the above. I mean, I think, you know, again, I think there are times when IU seems to want to assert itself defensively and really gets out and tries to pressure too far out on the floor. And I know we've talked about this in the past, where it's like, you, you know, if you just if you're gonna get beat, if you're gonna let them drive right by you, um, <laughs> you know, it, it just it seems strange that you are you are almost exaggerating the issue at times by pressuring guys out to, you know, 40 feet, you know, picking them up at, at midcourt. I'm not saying to sit back in the in the lane and wait for something to happen, but again, um, do you really want to pressure out that far? I think ball screen defense continues to be an issue. Um, you've seen improvement in some guys where they really are able to, you know, kind of step out and, and hedge more effectively. Um, but Brian, as you said, you know, he kind of gets in these positions. It reminded me, I know exactly the play that you're referencing when you when you talked about that, is where he just turned the corner and he just couldn't quite get there. And it felt a lot like this couple of plays at the end of the Wake Forest game where he's just, like, trying to run parallel to him and eventually block his shot but can't quite get in front to cut him off. And, um, you know, he continues to struggle in those scenarios. And, and I do and, – and this team in particular, um, they have scenarios where I think they know – that they need to help, but they're not sure where the help needs to come from. There was a play toward the end where Yogi got switched onto a bigger guy, and two different guys came to double-team this guy in the post. And it's like, well, you have to know at that point where your help is supposed to come from so that you don't commit three guys to one uh, and then really open things up. And I think, you know, one issue exaggerates the other. You can't stop penetration, and then, you know, they don't understand – who's supposed to help and who's supposed to stay home and how those rotations all go. And and then it just exaggerates the issue that much more, whether it be passing to an open guy because the rotation is slow or giving up offensive rebounds as they did in the first half because you've got guys you know kind of scrambling. Uh, so I really think it starts with that initial, you know, the initial on-ball defense, which has been a struggle for this team for two straight years. Uh, and, and I think it's just trying to figure out what they want to do consistently and how they want to defend these ball screens because I thought that was where they really got beat. And then in the first half, the other thing that really killed them at the rim was, you know, a lot of the back cuts where um, Notre Dame tried to do some of the similar things where they really extend the offense and have it at about free throw line high. And you're really just relying on guys to be aware enough of where things are and not get caught watching the ball. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes guys at this point are just trying to do too much and they get so focused on the ball that they're getting beat back door uh, on multiple occasions. So I, I don't it's not a simple answer at this point because it all just is snowballing as, as things get a little bit worse. And one thing leads to another and, and you've just got a complete breakdown. Apparently, Coach Cream is a little late to his uh, post-game radio show here, reading some tweets from Alex McCarthy. First couple comments from Cream: We did not come out with the level of focus that we needed to have. We've got to learn how to play with game plans. True. I'd say we also just need to guard whoever has the ball, regardless of game plan. But, you know, I'm sure he has good reason to say what he's saying. Uh, Will, real quick, over to you. We've been ping-ponging back and forth between negative news and positive news from you, and now you have a positive. A couple positive anecdotes about what Indiana did do well defensively tonight. Yeah, you know, even though we're talking about, uh, uh, the you know, not being able to protect the paint, uh, I thought both Yogi and Hartman both had really good charges. They took really good charges today. Um, Hartman's, he got a really good job. It was close, but he got a good job of getting out the, the restricted arc and taking a charge. And then before that, Yogi did the same thing, Got you know took position, stood his ground, and took the charge. So at least they're trying. I don't think the effort's there all the time, but hey, when they do it, 
they can take the charges. Yep. Well, guys, I want to spend some time looking ahead a little bit and talking about the first part of Indiana's schedule. Frankly, I thought we'd be able to do more of that tonight, but I was hoping for a little better performance from Indiana. But frankly, this performance, you know, there were obviously the positives with the freshmen to discuss, uh, but obviously some of the negatives with the defense that warranted discussion. So let's spend some time now looking ahead uh, to to Indiana's opening to the Big Ten schedule, which we talked about, and we'll get to that here in just a second. I do want to remind folks uh, that the Assembly Call is a listener-supported show. We greatly, greatly appreciate all of your support. And if you go to assemblycall.com slash support, there are many different options uh, that people have chosen. Uh, you can actually do recurring donations. You can do single-time uh, donations. We actually just, uh, during the game, while the game was going on, uh, we had someone select the Oladipo option for the uh, $4 a month recurring donation. So thank you very much uh, to the person who did that. Uh, and so if you like what we're doing uh, and if you... Uh, if you would like to support the show, you can do that at assemblycall.com slash support. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. All right, everybody, you are listening to the Assembly Call. Indiana won tonight, 99-72, to and that puts a cap on the non-conference schedule. The Hoosiers go 10-3. and uh, They are sitting at number, 20 fit, number 25 in the Ken Palm rankings. Interestingly, even after beating Notre Dame last weekend, the Hoosiers did not receive any votes in uh, in the AP poll. So currently the computers, at least... Uh, at least Ken Palm likes the Hoosiers uh, better than the voters do. But now we get into Big Ten season and we'll get a chance to see. You know, the Hoosiers obviously had the nice win over Notre Dame, missed opportunities in Maui and against Duke, and otherwise, you know, pounded uh, some competition that was sub 100 other than the Creighton game. But, you know, here we are, 10 and 3. And Andy, when you look at the schedule, you know, you've got at Rutgers, at Nebraska, home against Wisconsin, home against Ohio State at Minnesota, home against Illinois, home against Northwestern, all seven of those games, you look at Ken Palm, there's a 70% chance or greater of Indiana winning. Now, the question then becomes, can Indiana take care of business on the road against teams they're better than, and can they avoid stubbing their toe at home against better competition than they'll face on the road, but still I think teams, you know, in Wisconsin, Ohio State, that are, you know, somewhat inexperienced, you know, somewhat up and down, and even though Indiana's been up and down, they haven't been as up and down as those teams. So those are teams Indiana should beat at home. You know, so you look at this, Andy, and I mean, in your mind, is anything less than than seven and zero or six and one at a minimum is that going to be acceptable? And frankly, when you look at what Indiana has coming in the second half of the Big Ten schedule, can they afford to go any worse than six and one or seven and zero? Yeah, it's you know, I I have looked quite a bit at the schedule. I hadn't really thought too much about the record component of it, but I you know. I think that's probably fair. If you figure that you want this team to be able to get, you know, 12, 13, you know, Big Ten wins, which I don't think is a requirement to get the NCAA tournament at this point, given the Notre Dame game. Um, had they lost that game, it probably would have been. Uh, I just think if for nothing else from a confidence standpoint, it becomes uh, it becomes really important for these guys to, you know, really get things rolling. While it's been great to win these last five games since since the Duke game, um, you know, only one of those is really much to get excited about, and that being that Notre Dame game. So, uh, you know, if they're able to rattle off some wins and really get some positive momentum after uh, a whole lot of negative momentum built up between Maui and the, and the Duke game, you know, that five-game stretch there was about as bad as you could uh, you could have expected from this team, you know, early in the season. So uh, I think it's important from a confidence standpoint, and I think it's also important when you look at, you know, for all the – flaws with RPI and things like that. I mean, road wins matter quite a bit, and they've got a chance to really pick up uh, some solid road wins, albeit against, you know, the lower-end competition of the Big Ten. If, if you look at just primary ranking of the Big Ten teams, you know, Rutgers and Nebraska are two of the three lowest, uh, with Penn State being the one that's kind of in the, in the middle there, Minnesota just a tick below uh, Nebraska. And so those are your first three road games against you know, three of the five or three of the four worst, uh, you know, Ken Palm teams. So it's a chance to to get some road wins under your belt, which is always important uh, during Big Ten play. And and again, a chance to get some confidence, get some you know positive momentum in the RPI. And uh, you know, particularly these first couple of games, you know, Rutgers. I, I kind of throw this aside. I, you blew them out there last year. They've really not been good at all this year. I, I just look their biggest win. I think 
from a Pomeroy standpoint is over Howard uh, that they uh, that they've beaten. And then if you get to Nebraska, they've been up and down, and I think it probably helps a little bit that students likely won't be back for that. It seems like IU, I, I just remember a few years ago, they really struggled there against a far inferior Nebraska team. Um, they've got a couple guys that are still fairly decent that are there, but uh, you know they've been up and down kind of on a win-one, lose-one streak here over the last month or so. Uh, so, you know, again, two winnable games, um, and if this team wants to, you know, continue to harbor aspirations of a Big Ten championship, uh, which at this point you haven't played a Big Ten game, there's no reason not to have that as your goal and your aspiration. I think those are two games that you really have to win, and then you kind of take the other games from there. Wisconsin, uh, uh, you know, it would be easy to point to a coaching change and and say that might be something different, but I don't think there's any reason to expect Greg Gard to do anything different than what Bo Ryan has done. Uh, and they're a team that, at least from a fundamental standpoint, is not going to beat themselves and not get into you know a series where Kennesaw State did it for one stretch tonight where they just were you know jacking up shots with no regard for anything. Um, and Ohio State you know gets a little positive momentum. They beat Kentucky and played pretty well in that game. Uh, I think that's called into question some things about Kentucky in general, but. Uh, you know, again, those are two two winnable home games against what aren't going to be top 25 RPI teams, but could they be top 50 by the end of the year? Sure, they could, and, and those wins matter as well. So uh, a, a huge opportunity in front of this team to get off to a great start in these first seven, uh, seven games before that late January trip to the Cole Center, uh, and it will be interesting to see whether they can take advantage because I think we're all – taking a wait-and-see approach with this team at this stage of things based on what we've seen so far and the ups and downs that uh, that they've experienced. So uh, it's all right there in front of them. It lays out just about as well as you could possibly draw it up, but uh, remains to be seen whether they'll really be able to capitalize on the momentum that they've started to create, and, uh, and we'll just see what happens here starting a week from uh, tomorrow. Yeah, so over in our chat, uh, Trenton posted a, a good poll question, uh, which was, how many of those games do you think IU will win over that seven-game stretch? 67% of people said six, 33% of people said five. Interestingly, no one said seven. And, and this is really interesting. So this is, gonna, this is not going to make any sense to you. Uh, it will, maybe, if you watched last year when we did our pick and I picked Indiana to win every game because... For some reason, you know, when it when it comes to the next game, I can always find reasons why Indiana is going to win. And yet, for this poll question, I said five. Uh, because here's the thing: I think, you know, this team, this program, has not earned the faith to say, okay, you're favored in seven straight games by you know 70 percent or greater in this computer ranking. I have confidence that you're going to go out and do it. Like I just, I fear the toast of game. You know, Andy, you talked about, you know, that Nebraska win, shoot, the first season that we did the show, the freshman year of Zeller, and that was the actually Indiana's third straight loss. They, they you know, because they lost, what, four of their first eight, nine games uh, in Big Ten play that year, and that was one of the losses was at Nebraska. And it's been a place that Indiana hasn't played great. You know, uh, in in here is at Minnesota. We know that the barn has been a house of horrors for Indiana in the past. You know, you've got two teams in Wisconsin, Ohio State coming in with veteran coaches who, you know, probably aren't going to be intimidated by the, you know, by the arena. So I don't know when the losses will come. I just am afraid that they will. I'm afraid it'll come out of nowhere. You know, maybe it's the Nebraska game. You know, who knows? And that's the thing. I'm still in a little bit of with, with a little bit of a show me attitude with this team. Where okay, you know, ever since the Duke loss, you come back, you win five straight, including the win over Notre Dame, which is outstanding. You know, Indiana really took care of business. Now it's a big opportunity for Indiana to show they've taken the next step in maturity. And so I don't feel bad not fully buying in and holding them a little bit at arm's length and saying, prove it to me. But I think it's a big opportunity for them to do just that. And if they can be at 6 and 1 in the conference or even 7 and 0, oh, you know, now you enter that stretch of of tougher games later in the season with a little bit more margin for error. And you know, obviously you want to go out and win every single game, but building yourself in a little bit of a cushion before the schedule gets even tougher is important. And so, you know, perhaps that is why, you know, coach Crean seems a little bit cantankerous here, you know, at least in the post-game comments that I've seen, you know, probably wanted to see a more consistent effort from his team tonight, you know, knowing the opportunity that's ahead of them here at the start of Big Ten season. And, you know, we'll see if Indiana is able to take advantage of it. Uh, Will, I'm curious just to get your thoughts. I mean, no predictions on the actual games themselves, but just your general feeling about how Indiana will be able to fare in these first seven games. 
Oh, that's a great question, Jared. Uh, I'm kind of going to have to lean here with Andy a little bit and just kind of go with that wait and see approach. I mean, you guys pretty much talked about all of it. Um, if I had to choose a game, because I know you said no predictions, I think they're going to lose one, unfortunately. Um, this team has been surprising us, so I think it's going to be one of those shocker games. And just looking here at a couple of the teams and their strengths and weaknesses, I'm not so sold on that Ohio State game at home. I know it's at home. I know we play great at home, but Ohio State plays really good defense, and they can score some points. So I think that's a recipe for a potential disaster if IU decides not to show up. Yeah, and Andy, give me your, what are your general thoughts just on the conference, kind of how things are shaping up as we head into Big Ten play? I mean, obviously Michigan State, you know, has really positioned themselves well, and yet, you know, they're dealing with the loss of Denzel Valentine, and as we speak, at least as of about 20 minutes ago, they were losing to Oakland. Obviously, Purdue's had a great start to the season. You know, they lost to Butler. You know, you wonder if that's a template that teams can follow uh, to beat Purdue, and yet, you know, Butler does seem to have an uncommon ability to play with great attention to game plans, referencing that quote from Crean earlier, uh, and with a lot of toughness that maybe is uncommon to a lot of programs, so maybe that's not a template you see. Obviously, you've got Maryland, who's very good. Iowa's been pretty good early in the season. You know, now we talked in the preseason about where Indiana stacks up. Now that you've seen these teams play some, how does Indiana stack up for you in, in relation to the rest of the Big Ten? Yeah, I think you've really started to see these top few teams separate themselves from everybody else, at least based on what they've accomplished and, and how they've looked doing it. Uh, you know, Michigan State's coming back. They're within six on Oakland now and, and going to the free throw line as I'm watching it. But, um, you know, I think, you know, Maryland, their only loss has been at North Carolina in a game they played pretty well. Uh, first game back from Marcus Page from North Carolina. I think they've looked really good. I think Purdue for, uh, you know, they, they didn't look great, and some of their issues from a, a guard standpoint were exposed a bit against Butler. Uh, you know, that's going to be a concern, but I do think they've got a lot of talent and have, have been really strong defensively, and are going to be that's going to keep them in pretty much any game. And then, you know, Michigan State has been great, obviously without Valentine for these next few weeks, and who knows whether there's anything that lingers after that. We don't really know. Uh, but I think when at full strength, they've they've proven themselves to be really strong. So I think those three have by far been the most impressive. Uh, after that, you probably throw Iowa and IU in that mix where they've shown things here and there, but they haven't been uh, they haven't been terribly consistent. Iowa has been a lot better than I thought they would be. Quite honestly, um, I really thought losing Aaron White and Olasini would hurt them a bit more than it it seems to have. Um, so I think they've been pretty impressive, and I think that you know the, that that duo of Wisconsin and Ohio State that we just talked about is kind of in a, you're not really sure what to expect. I think history is on their side, um, but y you really don't know what's going to be there. I think Wisconsin will probably beat some teams that maybe it doesn't seem like they should beat based on who they've lost to at home so far this year, uh, and maybe lose some other games that in the years past they definitely would not have. Uh, and, and Ohio State, they had a really young team coming in, and I don't think anybody believed that Early in the season, they would be all that great. They lost a couple. The way they lost a couple games and the margin of some of these games they lost surprised me. But um, they always seemed to me like a team that was going to build a bit more toward the end of the season, and, and we'll kind of see what they become. So throw those in, and I think those are your you know top handful of teams. Illinois has been pretty ravaged by injuries, and Northwestern's been uh, okay, but hasn't really played anybody. And I think that that touches on most of the contenders. So I think there's a pretty clear top three where uh, I think Michigan I didn't really touch on. They're probably in the uh, maybe in the IU, Iowa uh, portion of things. So I think you've got a pretty clear-cut top three. Uh, anybody could emerge from the that, that next group of three, and, and then we'll kind of go from there. But uh, I think probably more top-heavy than we thought uh, is probably the main thing that's changed in my mind as we've moved into the season thus far. This is hilarious. So Mike Miller of the Herald Times uh, tweeting out from the post-game press conference with the players, IU players asked to give teams first-half performance a report card grade. Thomas Bryant, I don't know, but my actual report card is looking nice, like Steph Curry in the fourth quarter. So, <laughs> excellent. So, Thomas Bryant's grades must have been very good, which is excellent. You can criticize a lot of things about the IU program over the past several years. Uh, its academic performance certainly has not been one of them. And so, let's use this opportunity to give a tip of the cap to Marnie Mooney. I don't know if we've mentioned her yet this season, but she is awesome, clearly one of the MVPs of the IU program. Uh, and, and certainly while the Hoosiers 
have not always given us reason to be proud uh, on the court with some of their performances and even some of their decisions off the court over the past four or five years. Uh, they certainly have with their academic performance, and so uh, it's always nice to, to see that and to see it be important to the players like it clearly is to Thomas Bryant. Uh, well, as Will said here in our chat, in the spirit of Christmas, it's time to wrap this episode up and put a bow on it, and so we will uh, with last call here coming up in just a minute. Uh, I will just remind you one more time, go to assemblycall.com slash subscribe to get on the email list or text 44144, text Indiana to 44144. Make sure you get on the email list because our post-game analysis, we do not post it publicly. It is only for our email subscribers because we love you all so much. So make sure that you join that uh, and, and get all of the assembly call coverage that we deliver. All right, well, the Hoosiers won 99-72 to over Kennesaw State. They finish the non-conference portion of the schedule 10-3 and and head into conference play with still many, many of their goals ahead of them uh, and a nice what looks like an easy runway into conference play if they're able to take advantage of it. Uh, but let's wrap up tonight, fellas, uh, as we all get ready and, and get prepared for Christmas uh, with last call. And, Andy, uh, we will go to you first. Well, we're 13 games in, and I'm not sure that some of the questions that we've had about this team are really answered at this stage of things. Um, so while I'd love to say that we're over a third of the way into the season and uh, we know a whole lot more about this team than we did to start, uh, I'm not sure that I can really say that, quite honestly. But, um, you know, it's there's a lot of good college basketball games going on right now, and it kind of gets me excited for the conference season. And I think the... Uh, the days, although Rutgers is not too far removed from this, the days of the uh, you know sub 300 opponent on the IU schedule seem to be behind us, uh, and uh, uh, Rutgers is inching dangerously close to that. But I'm going to say after you know hopefully after that one things uh, things take a turn. I think it starts to be a little bit more of a grind, and the and the excuses of well it's not easy to get up for this game and that game and this team's terrible, and how do you stay engaged for that long? Those excuses kind of go out the window for me at this point, and so um, I'm glad to put some of those games behind us. It's been a good experience for some of these guys, and like you, I'm excited based on what some of the freshmen showed, and I think that there's going to be a game or two this season when one uh, one or two of those guys is the difference between winning and losing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the defensive questions still remain, and, and I really want to see what happens with some of these lineups. As we talked about it uh, for quite a bit, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see how defensive performance equates to playing time as we move forward in games that really are going to matter because no matter how bad we thought James Blackman Jr. played on defense tonight, IU wasn't going to lose this game even if he played 40 minutes. Um, but you can't say that about these Big Ten games, and I'm just interested to see how this team reacts. And as we said, the opportunity is right there in front of them. Your goals are still there uh, to win the Big Ten. Uh, you know, that starts on next Wednesday, and, and we'll see what they do. I think uh, a fast start, no difference when we talk about, you know, getting a fast start to some of these games. I think they've got to get a fast start to the conference season and, and see what they can do. So hopefully they, they take advantage of some winnable road games to start the, start the season, get those under the belt, and go from there. But for now, uh, I think the best thing we could say about this game, as we've said about a number of others, is that nobody got hurt. We saw some positive... Uh, Saw some positive signs from, from some of the younger players, and let's hope that all comes together as uh, Big Ten season starts next week. All right, guys. So I forgot to ask earlier in the show, so I do apologize. But, again, in the spirit of Christmas, because I'm trying to be festive here, guys. Come on, where's your spirit? But uh, if you could ask for one thing about this team, either it be a player performance, a trend that you want reversed, or perhaps just winning out in the conference schedule, if you can ask for one thing about this team for Christmas, what would it be? By the way, for our podcast listeners, you really need the visual here of Will wearing his candy striped shirt and his Santa hat as he asked this question. Uh, it really adds to it. Uh, I will go first here. All I want for Christmas is consistent communication on defense. And, and frankly, you know, if if that happens, I might believe in Santa Claus again uh, because you know so often we see you know lack of communication on switches, lack of communication in transition lead to easy buckets. And so for me, if Indiana can do that, it would plug one of the many holes that leak within this defense. Uh, so for me, if I had to narrow it down to one thing, uh, I would like that wrapped up in a box with a nice pretty bow on it, and I will unwrap it on Christmas Day, and I'll be like the Nintendo 64 kid because I would be so excited. Andy, what about you? I, I'm not too far off of what you. I mean, I think it's just consistent effort and and attention on defense. I think too many times uh, everybody gets caught up in how how their next basket's going to come and things like that. And we saw tonight that 
even against lesser competition, this team does have the ability to really lock in on defense, but we don't see that for more than two or three minutes in in a row. And I think even against Notre Dame, they missed some good shots down the end, and even though the defensive numbers look pretty good and there were a lot of stops on the stretch of that game, I think it was uh, in some ways related to effort, but in some ways related to just somebody missing shots, which is uh, you know going to happen. But I think that consistency on defense is, is what I think most IU fans are hoping for this year. Would be, At least that would be my guess. Yes. Will, what about you? Gosh, I got to echo you guys. I was going to just say for, you know, open the stocking and then they open up like a nice package full of effort. Then they can just, you know, or like a definition of the word effort and then they can kind of just go from there. All right, and your last call, your final thought on tonight's IU victory. Yeah, um, really, if I had to pick one thing that I want to see throughout the remainder of the season, I'm going to have to go back to something I touched on earlier, and that's going to be the ball movement. I love how they fed the post, how they found open shooters, either it was by a drive and kick. But, you know, the, at the beginning of the game, they weren't forcing a single shot, and that's the kind of offense that I want to see Indiana play some more of. But uh, other than that, we have Rutgers coming up here in just about a week, and so this is my time to plug in that we're going to be starting our second annual assembly call IU Big Ten Pick'em Challenge. Uh, last year we had a ton of contestants on it. It was a fun uh, contest to run. The winner got some free IU merchandise uh, in the spirit of Christmas, and so we're going to stay in that kind of mode tonight. Not going to spoil any surprises of what the winner might get this season, but uh, keep an eye out in the email here soon with a link and some directions to how to participate in the challenge. But, uh, yeah, look forward to everybody joining that, and uh, hopefully everybody can outpick Jared again because that was fun to watch last year. I finished in last place, but that is okay because I stood by my Hoosiers every single game, and so I will proudly probably do that again. Uh, but, hey, maybe this year I'll go undefeated doing it. Probably. You never know. You never know. You never know. It's, you know, yeah. Like I said, you know, I'm, I'm much I, – I, I just have a really hard time picking against IU in a single-game scenario, although I think, you know, my some of my season predictions were as pessimistic as anybody else heading into the season. But in single-game scenarios, I just – I can never pick against my Hoosiers. It's just – I don't know what it is. Uh, Also, Will, that's another reason for folks to get on the email list because we'll be emailing you the instructions for how to participate in that pick'em. We'll have some cool gear that you'll win if you win, and plus it's just a fun thing to do throughout the season and to kind of play along when we give our picks. Hey, wait a minute. We have to give our pick, don't we? Oh, you know what? We We do. Is anybody going to break news and pick Rutgers to win? Andy? Uh, Okay. No. No, I've actually watched Rutgers play basketball for two minutes, and that was enough for me this year. I'm good. All right, so, so I believe hey, for the, so so if I'm hearing everyone correctly for the record, I picked Indiana, Will picked Indiana, Andy picked Indiana, and Ryan picked Rutgers. Oh, that's unfortunate. Exactly what I was gonna say. He's not here. He gets Rutgers. So that's what happens. The group gets to make your pick if you're not here. <laughs> it's a good rule, I like it uh, alright everybody, well thank you all very much for joining us on this episode of the Assembly Call I don't have uh, any great final statements for last call except to say, as we always are we're very excited that the non-conference season is over uh, you know, it feels like for all of us watching them, doing the post-game show chatting about it, you kind of suffer through some of these sub-300 games and I think we all hope that future IU schedules will feature just more interesting games than we've had this year. Uh, you know, so many of the games we come on here and it feels like, well, we're not really going to learn much from this game, but, and then we stretch to try and extract a lesson from the game. Uh, and I do think, you know, there were some worthwhile things to take from this game, but there will be many, many more worth, worthwhile things to take from road games in the Big Ten and, and from playing tougher teams like Ohio State and Wisconsin at home. And so those games are upon us. Uh, you know, everything ramps up now that we get into Big Ten season. And, you know, I don't think any of us know exactly what Indiana team we will see throughout Big Ten season, but I just think it's extremely, extremely important for Indiana to get off to a good start. This this has not been a program that has peaked in February and March, but this schedule this year will demand it. And the irony of this schedule is that Indiana may be playing better late in the season, but it may not be reflected in, in the wins and losses, just because Indiana's playing tougher teams and they could play well and lose, and that is why starting out the season well, you know, 7-0, and 6-1, and one is really, really going to be important. So, you know, that's so important. Hopefully the Hoosiers, the players, you know, have a nice rest over Christmas break, come back ready, have a good performance against Rutgers to get Big Ten play started off on the right foot. We, of course, will be here to chronicle it for you on the assembly call after every single game. 
Join us at assemblycall.com slash live. We'll be here. Excited to talk Hoosier basketball. We always are. Thank you all for a wonderful October, November, and December so far of IU basketball. We have one more game in December before we get into the new year, and we'll be happy to do it with you, uh, with us, and you every step of the way. All right, everybody. Have a great night, a Merry Christmas, and we will talk to you on December 30th after IU Rutgers.